Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses, while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host of The Last Symptom. So glad that I could have you back here with me this week. Have you ever heard of a place called Shakanohe? Shakanohe. Ever heard of that? Shakanohe is the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. And Shakanohe is what the uh, Cherokee Indian call the Great Smoky Mountains. Do you know what it means? It means land of blue smoke. As you know, my great beloved life mentor, Dave Selvage, was a Cherokee Indian. And he used to take me frequently to Shakanohe. And uh, what a beautiful area. I thought I'd give you some facts about the Great Smoky Mountains or Shakanohe before we get started in today's discussions about emotional health and borderline personality disorder and all that stuff. Some things that you might find interesting. Did you know that the Appalachian Trail, for example, runs through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And it's fa- in fact, it's a section that I, I've never had any desire to do whatsoever because the regulations are so tight in there. And they regulate it so tightly. And uh, that just totally defeats my my purpose for being out in the woods. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong. Some regulations are necessary. But uh, out there in the Great Smokies, they just go way overboard. For example... You can't just set up a camp anywhere. You have to be in a designated, specific designated spot. You got to have all these uh, permits. Um, Fires are extremely regulated. I don't even know if you can have any fires out there in the Smokies. But anyway, it's just completely takes the purpose out of the reason I go into the woods which you know is to be which is meant to be an experience between you and nature where the two of you figure everything out Uh, not where you know a bunch of park rangers figure it out for you but anyway let's talk more about let's talk more about this uh, great national Uh, park the Great Smoky Mountains how many uh, acres how big do you reckon the Great Smoky Mountains consists of what kind of land area well 522,419 acres of pristine wilderness now here's something that might surprise you that uh, you know when you when you talk to people about the national parks I think what comes to mind just right off the cuff for many people is they think of Yosemite or they think of uh, Yellowstone, right? But believe it or not, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most visited national park in America. There have been more than a half a billion visitors since 1934. Now, Dave, the Cher- my Cherokee Indian mentor, you know, he'd always take me on vacation there to the Smokies, and we got to talking about that one time, 
and uh, between the two of us, we kind of figured that it's not because the Smoky Mountains are the most dramatic national park that it holds this distinction. Rather, it seems to me that it's where it's located. It seems to me that more people, it's ac accessible to more people just to kind of where it's because of where it's located. But it is the most visited national park in America. Of course, Great Smoky Mountains National Park was part of the homeland of the Cherokee Indian tribe, which is surely why Dave felt such a connection there and would take me there with him and his family on vacation so often. One of the most visited areas of the Smoky Mountains is something called Cades Cove. And uh, Cades Cove is like this great big plain low-lying plain that is surrounded by all these gigantic mountains and uh, there's an artist who's famous for that area for the Great Smoky Mountains and his name's Jim Gray in fact I got a couple of uh, signed prints of his hanging on my wall that were gifts from my mentor Dave Selvage and uh, they're by Jim Gray and of course, uh, you know, I'm very fond of the artist, fond of a lot of his work. My ex-wife Diane and I honeymooned in the Great Smoky Mountains. And one day, we were uh, riding around Cades Cove, and I saw this artist out there painting the mountains. He was, uh, he was in Cades Cove there painting, and uh, I started criticizing the easel he was using to paint. I think I was trying to show off for my, my new wife, my new bride. But I said, look at that. You see that easel he's using? Very poor choice of easel. That guy doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> I come to find out that was Jim Gray. <laughs> that, the same artist that I slobber all over and love. And here I was criticizing his easel and uh, accusing him of not being a real artist because he didn't know what kind of easel to use. But that was him, so I got to watch him painting in Cades Cove for a brief moment. Listen to this. More than 10,000 species of plants and animals are known to live in the Smokies. And estimates as high as an additional 90,000 undocumented species may also be present there in the Great Smoky Mountains. Over 100 species of trees grow in the park. Yeah, look at this. Here's another fact. <laughs> Listen to this. There's 850 miles of trails and unpaved roads for hiking in the Smoky Mountains. But get this. There are three shelters. <laughs> what can you do with three shelters that you absolutely must stay at? You can't stay anywhere else. But you got to go across, I think there's 70 miles of the Appalachian Trail. So you have to split 70 miles up into three. That's where you get to stay if you're hiking the AT in the Smokies. So it just doesn't appeal to me to hike the Smoky, the Appalachian, the, the Smoky Mountain portion of the Appalachian Trail. I don't even really like the Appalachian Trail anymore anyway because it's just too it's not wilderness you get out there it's not wilderness uh, there's a million people hiking it every day and uh, it just kind of has become this kind of Disney world for hikers and backpackers so it, it just don't appeal to me anymore I, li I like I like to be remote I like to run into very few people if any people at all so uh, most of the trails I pick these days are trails and times of year when I expect to run into nobody else. That's that's what appeals to me. But there you go. Three shelters and Smokies. 70 miles of the AT. <laughs> that's a long day, boy, I'll tell you. You get up in the morning, you got to hike, what, 20 miles, 20 something miles just to get to a, a shelter where you have to stay where you got to risk getting fined or something by the park ranger here's the wildlife that lives inside great smoky mountains black bear elk eastern cottontail rabbit red wolf groundhog 
red fox, coyote, bobcat, river otter, white-tailed deer, gray fox, wild turkey, and wild boar. Bet there's more than that. They're just giving us the, the short list. More than 13,000 members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians live in the 56,000 acre Koala Boundary, the eastern gateway to Great Smoky Mountains National Park in North Carolina. The Great Smoky Mountains are among the oldest mountains in the entire world. Yeah, here you go. Great Smoky Mountains National Park is within a day's drive of two-thirds of the nation's population. That right there is why Great Smoky Mountains National Park is the most popular national park in the, in the world. Okay, well, that is my introduction for this week. Let's talk about um, some things related to emotional health and those sorts of things. That's why you're here, right? I was reading uh, some articles that were contradicting Einstein here just a couple of days ago. And I'll tell you what happened while I was reading those articles that contradict Albert Einstein. I almost put it down. I almost put the articles down and just dismissed it as being crack pottery. But then, do you know what I realized? I realized that that was denial kicking in. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying that the article contradicting Albert Einstein was correct or that it was incorrect. That's uh, irrelevant to what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that the reaction I had inside of me was emotional. And because it was emotional and I didn't want to believe that Albert Einstein could be wrong, emotionally I begin to reject the information that's denial and I caught myself doing it so what did I do once I realized that it was because of denial that I was uh, dismissing the information well as soon as I realized that I said to myself how I feel how I feel about this article or this series of articles should not have any bearing whatsoever on me giving it a fair hearing. So if I'm going to read the article, I need to push my feelings aside and analyze the article on its own merits. Does it make sense what I'm telling you? Initially, my rejection of the articles was not because intellectually I could find anything wrong with the article or that the article I felt was not being reasonable or anything like that. It was just the fact that I've been so used to understanding Albert Einstein's explanation of the world and the universe that I have a, an emotional attachment to that. To the security of that so when I was reading this article and I you know the thoughts that I had in my head were all oh, this is crack pottery this is, this is stupid they don't know what they're talking about I even got a little angry and thought no they don't know what they're talking about but then I I caught myself in that moment and I said to myself wait a second Am I rejecting the information based on some fault I can find within the intellectual reasonings of the article, or is it purely an emotional response, which is denial, or, you know, this rejection is denial? And that's what happens in all sorts of different scenarios in life, is that our emotions kick in, and it happens under our radar and we think we're intellectually rejecting a thing when we're not we're emotionally rejecting it it's it's so sneaky the way that happens so i read the article a lot of it uh now 
view of pushing my feelings aside and just analyzing the article in a non-judgmental, non, you know, in a in an attempt to be non-biased about it. And you know, my my conclusions about the article are, are irrelevant for this discussion. For this discussion, I'm simply trying to highlight how sneaky denial can happen and it can happen in lots of different scenarios and in lots of different uh, settings revolving around lots of different topics you can see how hard it is then when especially a person has been living in denial for their entire lives how what a firm hold that denial can have on us so it's important to be honest with yourself ask yourself uh, why am I rejecting this am I rejecting it because I don't like how it makes me feel or am I rejecting it for legitimate reasons rejecting something because you don't like how it makes you feel is not a legitimate reason for uh, rejecting the thing a legitimate reason for rejecting a thing is that uh, it's false truly false truly inaccurate and you're able to analyze the thing kind of uh, in a non-biased you know in a way that's kind of disconnected from your feelings so that you can analyze the thing intellectually honestly and emotionally honestly without your feelings saying well I just don't like it so uh, therefore it's not any use to you the reason I bring this up is because you know this happens to me all the time people who read my articles uh, something about the article uh, because it contradicts some kind of established thing that they've that they take comfort in uh, they say that the articles baloney that the whole that my entire body of work is baloney because of how it makes them feel now they don't know that that's what they're doing they don't know it's because of their feelings that they're rejecting the whole thing but you know it happens all the time and here I caught myself doing it to somebody else's article over scientific stuff over Albert Einstein you know, theory of relativity and stuff like that so uh, I just thought I'd share that with you still happens to me and I've been at this now for a long time what is it now 13 14 15 years I've been doing this and so uh, you know there are certain tendencies that we have as human beings that uh, it's it's worth while resisting those tendencies and trying to be conscious of when those tendencies are kicking in you know because if you think about it whatever's true is true no matter how you feel about it <laughs> and whatever's uh, false whatever's complete bullshit is bullshit no matter how you feel about it no matter how much you want it to be true uh, is completely irrelevant it, e it either is true or it e or it's false and your feelings have no bearing on it one way or the other so each one of us should really if we're if we're genuine people our objective should be able to see the truth see what's false no matter how we feel about those things which is acceptance I think we're going to be talking about acceptance here a little bit more in just a bit because this is completely off topic and unrelated to my work with the last symptom my love of the wilderness and uh, uh, bushcraft and those sorts of things and at the same time because I'd like to be able to share these this aspect of my life with with people uh, I've created a brand new YouTube channel and a, and a rumble channel so that I can share my love of the wilderness and bushcraft and the backcountry and stuff like that for anybody who's interested so if you'd like to subscribe to that channel that new YouTube or rumble channel the name of the channel on both platforms is called The Practical Woodsman. The Practical Woodsman. So, if you're interested in seeing some stuff related to me in the outdoors, 
bushcraft, homesteading, uh, those sorts of things, feel free to subscribe to the Practical Woodsman YouTube channel. Those of you who are watching uh, this podcast right now, you'll see you'll see it on the uh, up here somewhere, and there will be links down in the uh, the additional information part of this podcast or the uh, video that you're either watching or listening to. Uh, I just recently, this past week, there was a snowstorm here, so I grabbed a bag, I ran out to the woods, and uh, spent the night in the rain and in the snowstorm, and I recorded the whole thing, put it up as a as a uh, kind of a documentary video. Very beautiful. I caught some beautiful scenes out there, and you know I'm always talking to you folks about the woods and what it's like in a snow in the snow and. Uh, what it's like at night in the woods and in a snowstorm and I thought man this is a prime opportunity for me to run out there and to kind of try to capture the nature of that and so that's what I did and then I realized you know this is this is really off topic for the last symptom so I really kind of need to have a standalone channel for these sorts of things so if you'd like to see that whole video and I've also got some shorts that I've been able to upload there uh, I, I recommend you uh, subscribing to The Practical Woodsman. And then you'll get to see it every time that I go out of the woods. I'm going to be talking about gear. I'm going to be talking about techniques, you know, fire starting techniques, uh, techniques for staying comfortable out there, and all those sorts of things. So, hope you like it. Before we go on, let's go ahead and do the announcements. TheLastSymptom.com, that is my website full of free resources for those who are interested in understanding emotional disorders, uh, particularly borderline personality disorder, and uh, authentic and permanent recovery from uh, emotional disorders. There are a few modest paid resources there as well, and it's those resources along with donations that allow me and have allowed me to continue doing this work for as long as I have and for any of you who have uh, donated in the uh, recently I just want to thank you so much uh, it's always catches me by surprise when a donation comes through and uh, I'm always very pleased to get it. it it helps a lot the paid resources I'll offer there at the last symptom dot com one-on-one -on -one phone conversations with me one-on-one -on -one zoom video conversations with me and of course the two-week intensive pre-recorded video course it's an intensive course it's called the last symptom fundamentals course and uh, it's meant to uh, give you a comprehensive understanding of everything related to emotional disorder and uh, truly the only path forward to authentic and permanent recovery so go visit the last symptom.com give it give it a look over. The Last Symptom has a really nice online community of like-minded people who are working on the same types of things uh, and it's located on the Locals platform that's L-O-C-A-L-S. If you'd like to join our community we'd love to have you there. The way you do it is you visit thelastsymptom.locals L-O-C-A-L-S dot com and uh, like I say, we're looking forward to seeing you there and getting into some good conversations. You share posts there, videos, um, images, uh, live chats. There's all sorts of things. One thing we've been doing here recently is we've uh, started this new tradition of having unhealthy memes Monday. So on Mondays, we will share uh, memes that we found on the Internet that present themselves as beautiful or nice and uh, we analyze exactly why that meme or those memes are particularly very unhealthy. It's turned into a really nice exercise and folks are having a good time with it. Of course on Fridays we do uh, Comfort Food Friday and also Forecast Friday so we share the forecast that uh, each of us are experiencing in our neck of the woods or neck of the world and uh, or we share some uh, an image or a recipe of our comfort favorite comfort foods and so it's not all business we, we do have a lot of fun one conversation we had there 
on the last symptom community recently was a conversation about are you ashamed of being normal in that post I talked about how one enormous breakthrough for me in my authentic recovery from borderline personality disorder was this shift in perspective that I made from believing that I should have no human flaws or tendencies. It really used to be my, my way of living was that any flaw that I could perceive in myself had to be eliminated or pretended away, pretended away mostly. <laughs> because there are flaws that you have as a person, you know, all people have flaws. And so most of the flaws that I was so hard on myself about, I would just pretend away because there's, there was no fix and f flaws that can be attributed simply to the human condition, right? So I just pretend them away. And it wasn't just like physical flaws. I'm talking about behavioral flaws, um, weaknesses about myself and those sorts of things. But I went from believing I shouldn't have none of those to then embracing many of those flaws and embracing them as amusing and natural to be in a human being. I began to kind of celebrate them, to be honest with you. And I'm not talking about things that can and must be fixed. I'm talking about things that are just part of the natural human condition that just make me human. So instead of me insisting that I be some kind of superhuman above other people, I begin to take comfort and accept that I'm just a normal person with normal flaws, with normal tendencies, and those sorts of things. You know, think about sex, for example. Some of your sexual uh, fantasies and stuff like that. You know, how, how ashamed would you be? If somebody knew some of your secret sexual fantasies. But what if you begin to accept that they that you're not the only person that has the fantasies like that? I mean there's there are books that sell millions of copies and movies that rake in millions of dollars based on fantasies like that. And why do these movies and books do so well? Because there's a whole lot of people out there daydreaming about the same stuff right but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about that used to be it would have shamed me and I would have thought no I, I'm, I'm, I need to be above that I need to be better than that and I went from that to well you know it's kind of normal it's kind of normal I'm not the only person thinking that way or or desiring that or, and those sorts of things so this meant that things that I would have once felt intense shame for and that other people could weaponize against me to shame me no longer had any power over me. You see that? Once I stopped viewing myself as somebody who should be uh, superhuman and I let go of that big lie and I begin to accept that I'm a normal person that as a human being if, if I want to be accepted as a human being that means being accepted for the tendencies and the flaws of a human being. And as soon as I accepted it as being natural to being a human being, it meant that I no longer had to feel ashamed about it. And because I no longer felt ashamed about it, other people couldn't weaponize it against me anymore. So we've talked in the past about how Fred Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood is famous for having said that anything human is mentionable and anything that is mentionable is manageable so sort of the same thing we're talking about here right now about letting go of this idea that you're not allowed to be flawed you're not allowed to be a human being you have to be more than a human being it's kind of the whole reason why I did the the infamous sex episode back, I think it was in the second season. It wasn't just so that I could talk about my sexual conquests and stuff like that. It's that, you know, the whole purpose of it was this. Everything that I have done, everything that I've fantasized about, 
all of my sexual cravings and desires, as embarrassed as it might make you feel, it's normal. It's natural. Those desires are natural. Those cravings are natural. It's part of the human condition. Now, I'm not saying that just because a person uh, craves a thing or just because they have a desire that it's healthy to just grant yourself every desire. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that having the desire in and of itself is natural. I'm not saying that morally it is okay to go chasing and fulfilling every single secret desire that I walk around with. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that having the desire at all is natural. It's a natural part of the human experience, of the human condition. So we were talking about this on the group, on the last symptom community there on locals and you know I brought up Fred Rogers again but the way that I applied this was I told uh, folks to think about the pictures folder on their phones if somebody got a hold of your phone got a hold of your pictures in your phone got into the hidden file of your phone would they be able to terrify you blackmail you or shame you with what's in there now don't worry I don't have access to your phone I'm just asking you it's a thought experiment think about your phone right now maybe some of the text may, may, how, what if they could get into your uh, text messages what would they find there how would that make you feel would you feel ashamed would you feel embarrassed? Got into your pictures. Would you feel ashamed? Would you feel embarrassed? Now, assuming that you have nothing illegal on your phone, let me ask you this question. Do you think your phone is any different than anybody else's phones? Think about that. Do you think that your phone is any different than anybody else's phones? What you got on there and stuff. Things that you're terrified for other that you'd be terrified for other people to see or to get a hold of. I'd like you to try to see the freedom from self-imposed slavery that comes from realizing that you aren't some sort of extreme weird case of humanity, but that you are instead a human being and part of being a human being is accepting the weird things that human beings do you know think about the uh, sexting or people texting nudes to each other if you've done that and you probably have because most people have how did you feel about it afterwards like I said we're talk we're not talking about anything illegal here and I'm talking about things that are completely legal and that most adult people engage in. When, once you see that is, it is a natural tendency of human beings to do a thing, and you realize, that, yeah, you, it's your tendency too, what is there to be ashamed of? <laughs> what is there to be ashamed of? So again, when I did the sex episode back in season two, the whole purpose of that was, it was my way of saying, look, anybody who wants to pretend that they haven't felt these exact same types of desires or fantasies or daydreamed about having such experiences is lying. They're lying. And there were people who dropped, you know, their subscription to the podcast that day and never come back. Those aren't very emotionally honest people <laughs> because uh, they have fantasized about some of those things and they have not turned the channel on TV when some of the certain things like that have appeared on TV and, the, and those sorts of things so if a person's in denial about what their real feelings and desires are that that person is the one with the problem and once again I'm not saying that it's healthy to give in to every single desire that 
that as human beings we might experience. But I am saying that the only healthy way to live is to accept that those desires are really there when they are there. You can't identify, understand, and properly manage or fix anything that you refuse to accept is there in the first place. That was the whole point of that that episode. So back to your phone. Could, could somebody shame you with your phone? I've given this some thought over the years since my recovery. You know, before recovery, somebody could have used things like the picture roll on my phone to devastate my life. But that, that ain't true no more. Now, though I would be angry that a person had violated my privacy by getting it onto my phone, you know, my reaction, think about, you know, I'm on The Tonight Show with uh, Johnny Carson yeah because we we got in a time machine we go back and Johnny Carson I'm on the Tonight Show on TV and somebody says hey I got your phone and they start going through my phone telling everybody what's on there uh, although I'd be angry that my privacy was violated at the same time my position on that would be to shrug and say something like you know you're you're trying to frame this as I'm the only person who has ever sexted or sent or received a nude picture that's the way you're trying to frame this what what universe do you live in because that's not reality in reality almost everybody's done that so it's pretty normal it's so common that me having done it, what's what's significant about that? There's no nothing significant about that. It's a natural thing that human beings have been doing now for the past 20 years, 30 years since cell phones were invented. And so I'm a person, and you're you're trying to shame me for doing person things. <laughs> you know, you're trying to shame me for doing human being things. That's kind of rich. But the point is, I wouldn't feel any shame because I know there's nothing shameful about being a normal human being. Here's an excerpt from an article I read the morning that we had this conversation on the Last Symptom community that really drives the point home. Now take note of the fact that apparently so many people are ashamed of being normal that Google has to pretend that their users want to hide pictures of puppies. Here's how it goes. Today, Google announced a new feature. Now you can add photos to a locked folder where they will be hidden behind a pin or biometric ID and won't show up in your photo roll. The feature is for your nudes your naked pictures, but Google won't say that. Google executive Satan the Devil explained, this feature would have been helpful for me last year when we surprised our kids with a new puppy and we needed to hide the photos before we brought the dog home. See what she's doing? She's trying to say that the reason why they invented that feature is for something as rare as wanting to bring a new puppy home. What do you think happens more? People hiding nude pictures or people bringing new puppies home? I'd say new puppies happen far less. Taking, storing, and sharing nude photos is an extremely common thing people do, the article goes on to say. Survey after survey over the past decade has shown that most adults sexed and a lot of them take or store nude photos and send them to partners. It's pretty normal. Yet when Google wants to announce a feature that helps people do it more safely, it has to hide behind secret dogs. That was from the article. Google just revolutionized your nudes but won't admit it by Eric Ravenscraft. Here's something interesting. uh, on the last symptom community 
at uh, thelastsymptom.locals.com. I recently conducted a super duper scientific poll and I asked, which is better for contemplation and reflection? A video or a photograph? Let me give you a second to think about that. Which one is better for contemplation and reflection? A video or a photograph? Here's some of the comments and then I'll tell you how the poll turned out. Although I voted for a photograph, I prefer both for contemplation. I voted photograph because I can just look at the photograph and reflect back on the moment at a later point of time. This can even be done when I'm busy with my day. With a video I can't do that. Also, if this is about something in someone else's life and they're describing the moment, then I would prefer a video. I like to know all the details surrounding the story. For reflection of it, I would like a photo. For me, a video is for getting in everything there is to know about a moment or a thing, but a moment is there for thinking back on the same thing later. I'm really curious about you folks listening or watching the video here. What you prefer. What, what do you find better for contemplation and reflection? Somebody else says, uh, in a video you can see the subtleties and how someone really feels. In a photo, you can look really happy but not be happy at all. Well, I would argue that that's true for video too. Another person says, my gut says photograph because if the picture is meaningful enough, it stays in your head for a long, long time. When I analyze a picture, there's more room for me to come up with my own interpretations and take things from it. Somebody else said that a photo can be viewed without the noise, reveals more inner thoughts and reflection with quietness and solitude. Another person says, uh, although I voted video, I thrive in both. All things considered, I choose video because it paints a clearer picture of mov movement, degrees, and frequencies of gestures. Another person says, uh, I picked photograph, but reflecting on information to think about, I was reminded of a video I took of my little girl when she was just learning to reach out for things in bubbly bath water. I remember filming her and what I was focused on, and then years later watching it back and noticing what she was focused on, her pride in reaching her goal. I felt so bad that I had missed the real moment. Very interesting. I was uh, sorting my video and photo collection, which is what made me think of this and made me create the poll in the first place. So here's the way it turned out. 42.9% said a video. 57.1% said a photograph is better for contemplation and reflection. My vote was for a photograph. You know, strictly for contemplation and reflection, I prefer a photograph. It captures a single moment in time. It's quiet. You're not distracted by sounds or uh, movement or anything like that. It, uh, you can really sit there and kind of get drawn into that, that specific moment without distraction. So that that's my vote. But anyway, I'm curious what you folks would think. So if... You get to hankering, why don't you jump on to uh, thelastsymptom.locals.com, scroll down, find where that poll is, and go ahead and place your vote. On the last symptom community on Locals, it's pretty relaxed. It ain't like the old days, where in, when I was on other platforms, I was pretty militant about various things. When I was first getting started with the last symptom, I've in this new um, on this new platform on this new community many things relaxed and it's just because of the nature of the platform it's it's different than the old groups and so uh, I can be more relaxed and uh, but I wanted to tell you one guideline that I have in place and I just kind of wanted to talk about this for a minute you know, in the old days when the last symptom was first getting started and that was uh, you know loathe to talk about what platform that was but it was Facebook um, 
you know, I would ban links and references to other voices on the subject of emotional disorders, borderline personality disorder specifically, within that group. And the reason why I would do that is because there was absolutely no way I could spend my time reading every single book by other people or watching hours of other people's videos to verify that their messages did not conflict with the last symptom in any way. My intention with the last symptom has always been for it to stand out as uniquely straightforward, cohesive, comprehensive, accurate in itself. If I have a thousand members all recommended books that not only contradict me, but contradict each other even, just a great big orgy of conflicting theories and opinions. This does not help a single person make authentic strides toward real recovery. In fact, it, it really only serves to muddy the water for people who are already having a hard enough time sorting the details of those things out. So that's why nobody needs to be reading 10 different conflicting sources on the subject of borderline personality disorder. I don't even understand why a person would do that. The only thing anybody needs, now listen to what we're, I'm not talking about preference or what you enjoy. I'm talking about what a person needs. A person who has an emotional disorder, has borderline personality disorder, what do they need? Well, it's pretty obvious what they need. They only need one source of information that is accurate and comprehensive and can help the person stay focused on what really matters and discard anything that does not matter. Right? That's all a person needs. What else would you need? If your interest is in genuinely ridding yourself of an emotional disorder, of borderline personality disorder, of narcissistic personality disorder, of any of these things, if your interest truly is ridding yourself of these things for real, what do you need? All you need is a comprehensive source, one source of information that is comprehensive and accurate and can help you stay focused on what matters. And to disregard all the stuff that doesn't matter is just a time waster, time and energy waster. So I've said it a million times, entertaining a hundred different sources of information is alluring. I understand that because you, you keep in mind, I at some point I was just getting started. You know, years ago, I was sitting down and I was just getting started and I ha had all this endless amount of um, of resources and information just waiting for me to pick through. And that's alluring. It's alluring to have all of that information because it makes you feel like you're accomplishing something when you're not. So think about me sitting around reading dieting books for a year. You know, I dedicate every evening. I come home from work, I sit down and I just crack open one of these diet books and I do this for a year. Every evening, sitting down, really digging into these books, comparing them, weighing the pros and cons of each one, admiring the writing and the pictures, taking mental notes. Of course, one book says I should focus on protein exclusively. Another says I should focus on fat and protein, just avoid carbs. Another says that I shouldn't be concerned about any of those things, but that I should instead focus exclusively on caloric intake. Another says that my real focus should be on exercise and on fasting. In fact, I, I know of a book uh, it's called the Big Mac book, McDonald's book or something like that, Big Mac diet book. Guy lost like 100 pounds eating Big Macs from McDonald's. So I, I could read that one too. Consider, you know, I'm considering all these books. They're all contradicting each other. But I dedicate a lot of time to considering each one. And at the end of the year, 
what have I accomplished? Nothing. In fact, I now weigh more <laughs> than I did before the year started. But do you see that how as long as I was uh, diving into all these books and reading all these things, I could at least console myself with the illusion of doing something constructive while in reality not accomplishing anything at all, not doing anything at all. So if you folks out there, you want to read other literature, um, you know, continue entertaining lots of different podcasts on this subject, watching hours of videos on the subject of emotional disorders or borderline personality disorder, while at the same time following along with the last symptom, that's your prerogative. <laughs> of course, I, you know, I couldn't stop you even if I wanted to, and I don't want to. I just don't think it's very smart because, folks, I'm somebody who had the disorder for my entire life up until my late 30s, and now I'm somebody who really does not have it. Nobody else did that for me. I did that for myself. You know, no super-duper famous psychologist on YouTube or Quora got me there or helped me or provided me with the insights for it to happen. I did it for myself. So I try to imagine myself in other people's shoes observing me or listening to me or, you know, uh, consuming aspects of my work. And I tried to imagine if I'm, if I'm somebody suffering from borderline personality disorder or let's say I'm in a relationship with somebody else who has it. I can't help but assume that upon discovering the last symptom, I wouldn't drop all of the books that I've been holding on to and, and really throw myself into trying to understand exactly how the last symptom guy did it. And then paying almost exclusive attention to him and working to get the same results that's what I would do if if I were not me <laughs> but I guess if I were not me but I had I still had the same tendencies uh, that would be my tendency if I were in a state of desperation nobody else would bring me any positive results or anything and I start hearing me talking about how wow yeah I lived with it almost till I was 40 and you know, it took me about seven years, but I finally got it out, got figured it out, eliminated it. I've been living for years now without it. That would get my attention. I would, whatever YouTube channel I was subscribed to, I would unsubscribe. I would be focused on the guy who did it, on the guy who was once in my same situation and who now was not. So think about that. When I start talking about something that's, when I start talking about this process and I tell you that something matters, but that thing seems insignificant to you, and when you look around at your other sources of information, they don't seem to be placing much importance on that thing. If I were you, I would assume that the last symptom is right and everybody else is wrong. Because obviously, if I manage to authentically rid myself of the disorder, and I'm telling you that a thing matters, there's a reason why I'm telling you that. It's because it is necessary for authentic recovery. I wouldn't tell you it was if it, if it wasn't. You know, on the flip hand side, uh, the opposite is also true. If I tell you that a thing is irrelevant, that that thing is irrelevant to recovery. But all but your other sources of information are telling you that it's it's the most one of the most important things that you need to be focused on. I would trust me. I would trust me. There's a reason why I'm telling you it's irrelevant, and that's because it's irrelevant. I wouldn't be where I'm at otherwise. 
You know, there are certainly voices on this subject that are much more famous than me, much more popular, much more well-known. But why isn't everybody cured? It, if the most popular, the most well-known, the most listened to, the most famous sources of information on these subjects know what they're talking about, why are there... Why are there people walking around with borderline personality disorder in their adult years at all? Think about that. It is for the very reason that they are not focused on the things that do matter. They're instead focused on things that don't matter. That is the reason why there aren't more people cured. And who is dispersing that information? The popular voices on this subject, the most famous, the most followed, the most listened to. They're telling you things that are not getting you anywhere, that are irrelevant. They're telling you things, well, they're telling you that the things they tell you are important or not, and the things that they tell you are not important are. That's why people aren't getting anywhere in greater numbers. The reality is I'm sort of a rare case, and it, it ain't because I'm so special or super smart, you know, I'm not smarter than everybody else or anything like that. The 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 reason the reason why I'm a rare case is because I'm one of the few people who did completely rid himself of the disorder for real. And I didn't accomplish it by means of these other sources of information that many like to entertain. To give you just one example, it's become very popular here recently. I mean, in the last, I've, I've noticed it's become very popular in the last year or so. Um, I had heard whispers of it four or five years ago, but uh, here in the last year, those whispers have gotten a lot louder. That some in the professional community have gone to call calling borderline personality disorder by a brand new name. In fact, I've noticed that on a lot of my old articles on Quora, Quora has updated them so that my titles don't just say borderline personality disorder. They've added this new name for borderline personality disorder. Now, why has the professional community gone to the trouble to take a disorder that everybody already knows of and give it a new name? Is it because it's going to truly help you understand the, the real nature of the disorder better? No, in fact, the opposite is true. What they've named it obstructs people even more from understanding the true nature of the disorder. They could use their energy and time and resources, they themselves, the professional community, into truly trying to gain real insight on the disorder. But that's too much work. You know what's easier and more flashy? It looks like you're doing something when you're not. You give it a different name. People say, oh, you're so smart. Oh, that community of people who, of experts, they're so smart because they gave it a new refined name. But this is like a lady who wishes she could renovate her bathroom, but she can't because she doesn't know anything about carpentry or plumbing. So, she just paints the bathroom instead and says, well, look, I renovated my bathroom, brand new bathroom. I painted it and it's a brand new bathroom now. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all for appearances. The professional community does this, this lip service type stuff for appearances, both for themselves. You know, it's appearances for themselves in the sense that they're try they, they like to to make themselves feel smart and celebrate just how smart they are and everything. You know, it's a getting off on the illusion of intellect. And for others, you know, it's a, it's a showy thing. Look, we know this thing so well that we're refining our the name that we have given it. So the new name for borderline personality disorder that some have embraced is emotionally unstable personality disorder. The name itself asserts 
that some people have more stable emotions than other people. That is horseshit. Let me say it again. The new name is Emotionally Unstable Personality Disorder. They want you to believe that your emotions are malfunctioning. And that is horseshit. Your feelings aren't behaving any differently than any other normal person. And if you don't understand why that's true, maybe you're a new listener or something, uh, you either need to take the Last Symptom Fundamentals course or you need to listen through all the episodes of the Last Symptom podcast until you catch up and understand why your emotions aren't behaving any differently than any other person's. The name itself asserts that some people have more stable emotions than other people. That emotions are the problem. Your emotions are malfunctioning. It's not even a little bit true. Nobody's feelings operate any differently whatsoever than anybody else's feelings. Our feelings originate with our thoughts, perspectives, memories, dreams, attitudes. What are those? They're thoughts. Feelings are not something we do. When you're feeling a thing, you're not doing that. Feelings are something we experience. When you're feeling something, that you're experiencing that. You're not doing that. Screaming is doing a thing. Feeling like screaming is not doing a thing. Feeling like screaming is instead an experience you're experiencing. You're not doing it. You're experiencing it. Because feelings aren't something we do, but instead something we experience, the idea of people being able to control their feelings is a lie and a complete myth. Doesn't it make you angry? It makes me angry that the professional community, the community of people, tasked and supposedly qualified to be providing you information about your disorder can't even get that right. They don't even know that a person doesn't can't control their feelings it makes me it makes me angry it, it's so unjust the fact that these people get away with this nonsense controlling feelings is not something human beings are even slightly capable of it's like saying that you should be able to control what the temperatures are going to be in your neighborhood tomorrow you will experience whatever the temperatures turn out to be but you don't have any control over what the temperatures will be. When you observe a person who seems to be perfectly in control of their feelings, are they controlling or regulating their feelings? Not even a little bit, no. They're regulating their thoughts and their outward behaviors, but they are not regulating their feelings. Now, it's true, if you have an emotional disorder, you're used to your feelings being volatile and seemingly more exaggerated than other healthy people. But it's not because your feelings are malfunctioning. And it's not because of your failure to regulate your feelings, something that you can't do. People, you don't, that is not a a capability that human beings possess at all. Your feelings have nothing to do with it at all. Instead, it's the perspectives and attitudes that you live with that explain the way your feelings naturally behave. So if you were to take any other perfectly healthy person and give them your same perspectives and attitudes, and then you put them into the same situations where you say that your feelings are behaving erratically and 
and uh, out of control, guess what? Any person sharing your perspectives and attitudes in that same situation, their feelings would behave almost identically. It's not your feelings. It's the perspectives and attitudes that people live with. That's why their feelings behave the way they, that they do. It's not the feelings' fault. It's the fault of the perspectives and attitudes that a person lives with. That is the, the, the bold truth. So the professional community and these quote-unquote experts, even in the choosing of a new name for a disorder that they never genuinely understood to begin with, even in the choosing of a name, their work primarily interferes with you ever authentically recovering from it. They want you to believe that your feelings are the problem. They're unstable, quote-unquote, you see. There's no such thing. There is no such thing as a person having unstable feelings. A person's feelings behave directly according to the perspectives and attitudes and situation that a person finds themselves in. If, If a person is acting calmer in a situation where you're freaking out, it's because the person who is calm has different perspectives and attitudes with which they are interpreting that experience. Period. But the professional community want you to believe that your feelings just act that way on their own. Like a chemical reaction or something. That your feelings are defective. You're defective. It's all you and your feelings fault. What is it the... Uh, what was the what was the root cause of you developing a disorder in the first place? The message from your parents that you're defective and your feelings are defective. And you go to the professional community, and here they come up with a stupid goddamn name that, that tells you what? That you're defective and your feelings are defective. God, it makes me angry. What's the truth? The truth is that you simply adopted some unhealthy attitudes and perspectives that need corrected. Once you do that, your feelings will naturally adjust accordingly. So the same people charged with helping you are in fact actively working to prevent you from getting better. Now I'm not saying that they they do this with malintent. Not all of them. But when their interest is in appearances, more than actually helping you, when their primary focus is appearances and getting high off their own sense of intellect rather than truly helping you, then it is kind of with malintent in it. I mean, really, it's self-interest. Self-interest over your suffering is the call is the reason for them doing this. That and complete incompetence. Complete incompetence. And then they drive around in their shiny SUVs, hobnobbing with the, the elites in society, while you continue to suffer and they keep you there. It should make you mad. The same energy that these charlatans spend painting the bathroom could be used to gain genuine insight on these disorders. But no, that doesn't cause much attention and does not appear as smart. That sort of work happens in quiet spaces, doesn't it? Away from people and you don't get attention that way. So all of this is a long-winded way of saying that almost every other voice on the subject of borderline personality disorder that I've ever encountered and on emotional disorders, those voices fundamentally conflict with my work and the things I teach. No, not everything they claim is completely false, but there is enough in there that is total horseshit that I don't want my work and the last symptom to be anywhere associated with them. So, if you join the last symptom community at thelastsymptom.locals.com and you're there to learn, it's not a good idea for you to be recommending other people's books and to be recommending other voices on these subjects within our community there 
unless think about this unless you've completely recovered from your emotional disorder until that happens and unless that happens it's probably not a good idea for you to be recommended books on that subject to other people period after all how would you know if that book is good or not or if that YouTube personality knows what he or she is talking about or not if you've not yet fixed the things you're trying to fix isn't that sort of a cart before the horse kind of thing the proper way to go about it is to concern yourself with authentic recovery make that happen first once you do that then you'll be able to look at information and vouch for its accuracy and all that you will know because you'll know what worked also circling back to the uh, diet books we were talking about earlier it ain't enough to just speculate and read and talk about a thing for forever you know at some point if I want to lose weight for real rather than just reading about losing weight or theorizing about the best way to lose weight I will have to settle on a single attack approach won't I and really give it my all otherwise what I'm doing is just wasting time but doing so in a way that at least appears like I'm really busy and involved you should be interested in really ridding yourself of the disorder so that you don't need me you don't need anybody else you can instead be a source of information for other people trying to do the same thing that needs to be your focus not taking comfort in reading and entertaining nine million different voices on the subject and those sorts of things so i had uh, a lot of things to share with you today i just printed off a bunch of stuff and I didn't get I didn't even get through a fraction of it so I guess that's information for next week um, I would like to see you over there at the last symptom locals community and uh, people coming in all the time into our community but not everybody is involved there what I mean is that not everybody is uh, really active and uh, you know giving an exchange of dialogue and stuff like that so if you are considering joining the group you know if you'd like to lurk and uh, just get what you what you find useful to you from the group without participating too much that's up to you I don't want to give you a hard time about that but I think that uh, when people participate and they have conversations they contribute uh, it's a more enriching experience so that's just something to think about um, you know, think about the fact that if nobody wanted to participate or interact or communicate, it'd be a pretty boring place. And then we wouldn't have a place. It's because nobody would want to do any talking. It'd just be me all the time. So just something to think about. I hope you're all doing well, and I hope you enjoy uh, seeing my adventure out in the woods. There's, I've got tons of video content of me doing bushcraft and survival and homesteading and all these things in nature you know but really being out in the wilderness and interacting with the wilderness I've got so much content that I've accumulated over the years it's just going to take me a long time to sort it out get it up onto the practical woodsman uh, YouTube and rumble channels but i do have some good stuff there now if you want to look at it folks i hope you have a wonderful week i'll catch you next week i've got a ton of stuff to talk about and i hope you take good care of yourselves mm-hmm.